All right. Thank you, everybody, for attending uh, this entire week. This is day four of Wisconsin Water Week. And today we're bringing you a presentation I'm very excited about. Um, we are bringing you Superior Makers, um, a celebration of Lake Superior and the arts. So my name is Alex Faber. I am the executive director of the Superior Rivers Watershed Association. Um, and joining me here uh, is Lissa Radke, my co-host. Uh, and she is running our Zoom. And we also have three really amazing women here that are going to present their work to you and how they celebrate the water through their craft. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping, a reminder to use the Q&A function on the video uh, rather than the chat function to ask questions. We're going to save questions for after everyone's done their presentations. Um, there's also a function where you can upvote people's questions. So if you've seen somebody ask a question that you agree with and want to have answered, go ahead and upvote that so that way we can see it at the top of our list. Also, because we have three presenters here today, uh, make sure to reference people by name if you're asking a question specifically for somebody. Um, that way we know who to ask the question to. Um, so without further ado, I will start a little introduction. Um, so we have here three women who have been inspired by their experiences living near the world's largest lake for many years and that have expressed their connection to the waters, land, and communities through photographs, images, and traditional basketry. Um, each speaker brings a unique perspective about the places they call home, and each has found ways to share her connections in thoughtful and creative ways. Our first, first speaker is Mary Dotery, a Bayfield resident who created Words for Waters from her passion for Lake Superior and the threat of a major source of pollution of that lake. Um, and welcome, Mary. Thank you. I'm excited to do this. It's been a while since I've revisited my Words for Water project. So it was really great to go back and look at all the photos and the words people have shared with me. Um, Words for Water is started in response to the Pinocchio mine that was going in back in, back in the day that we stopped. But what it, what it kind of came from was um, me thinking about, there's a, there's a man named Frederick Buechner who says, you find your vocation at the intersection of the world's deep hunger and your deep gladness. And that's the space that I think that I've chosen to um, express my advocacy and my passion for things that I care about. And so I'm a photographer and, uh, and I'm a writer and I love stories. And I think that um, what happens in, it's hard to, I think there's strength in numbers and I wanna share something, um, if I, just so you guys can see what I'm talking about. It's a murmuration and I'm going to share my screen. I'm gonna be technology, well, hold on, sorry. Okay, share screen. And I'm gonna show you this. So it comes down to the fact, this is a memoration, which is um, a whole bunch of birds, right? They're moving in concert with each other. And um, as a, hold on, I gotta turn this off. As a community organizer, you know, um, I, th that's a difficult thing to wrangle because how do you get, how do you get people to stand together and work towards a common program. And so I, when I was wondering about that, I thought I had that image of a murmuration in my head, which is that beautiful grace and that ballet of movement, but it's not, there's not a grand master orchestra con conductor making that movement happen. How it happens is, is that each individual bird looks to its seven closest neighbors to determine how it moves. So that entire graceful movement that we see is entirely informed by individual connection in that flock or on the ground. And so um, I thought, well, what about uh, taking that idea and then also taking the idea of a watershed, which is watersheds move towards a common body of water, but they don't say everyone's got to be a class four rapids and they don't say everyone's got to be a wetland. It just says if we're all moving towards the same space, then that's what matters. And so I was talking to my husband in 2014 and I was like, what are we gonna do? I, I, don't want, I have this idea, but I don't know um, how to bring it to life. And we came up with the idea of a collective storytelling project, which is it's a very simple, Words for Water is a really simple program. All I just go to someone with a chalkboard and I say, if you could speak for water, what would you say? And they write their word down on that chalkboard. 
And what I noticed in the beginning, and I haven't, you know, I haven't revisited um, Words for Water. I went to, actually went to Farm Aid last year to do Words for Water at Farm Aid. But um, what I find consistently is that people say, well, my word's already been taken, or I have so much to say, I can't fit it all on a chalkboard. And what that tells me is that um, we have gotten out of the practice of thinking collectively. When you hear, when I hear someone say, my word's been taken, I'm like, oh no, that hasn't been taken. That means that you are in the space where a lot of your friends and neighbors and community members are. That means your word has more power. That word has more impact because it's being spoken by people that you are, don't know. So that means that your word is tapped into that kind of that subconscious um, heartbeat that's in every community. And then when you hear someone say, well, I've got so much to say, I need four chalkboards. I would say, well, guess what? You don't have to say it all. And that is the beautiful thing about the collective is that you get to be in your lane knowing that the rest of the folks, if you're looking towards that same goal or you're valuing the same things, we're all moving towards that together and you're not in charge or responsible for handling the entire situation. So I'm gonna share my screen again. I'm gonna show you chapter three of Words for Water. Um, and so you can kind of get a sense of how it ends up looking. So I need to share my screen, hold on here. This is when you know I grew up in the era of Pong and not computers. Okay. All right.
So I always get a little choked up when I see these videos because I, if you notice when you look at, when people are speaking their truth about something, their energy changes. And if you looked at that, when you watch that video, people's faces were incredibly clear. They were passionate about what they were speaking because they're in that space of truth. And um, for me, it comes down to, uh, from my art and how I choose to interact with the world, I view art as advocacy that it's at the service of creating, collecting power and using that power to change things, to protect and to preserve what we love. So I'm just gonna finish it up with this great poem that I have about from Maria Rukeyser, and it's called Wherever. And this is what I think art, for me, this is what art is. Wherever we walk, we will make. Wherever we protest, we will go planting. Make poems, seed grass, feed a child growing, build a house. Whatever we stand against, we will stand feeding and seeding. Wherever I walk, I will make. And so that for my maker's philosophy, that is using art to um, just to make some stuff happen. So thank you, Alex. I'm gonna pass it back to you. Thank you, Mary. That was wonderful. Um, I love that you have your website up there. So just for everybody's reference, there is a handout attached to this session that has links to all of these artists' websites or videos related to what they're doing. Um, so you can get that in the handout, otherwise it is wordsforwater.com. Um, so also feel free to put questions in the chat for Mary. Um, we'll take those at the end, but you can put them into the Q&A anytime. Sorry, not the chat, the Q&A. Um, and if you see somebody else asking that question, same question that you want to ask, uh, go ahead and upvote that. So our next guest is Jamie Penny Ritter, also of Bayfield, who creates unforgettable and timeless artwork for her studio in Washburn. And her business is called Bemuse Design and Photography. Um, welcome, Jamie. Hi. <laughs> um, I'm going to jump right into my screen share. If I can find it, let's see. So I have been all over the place and, and um, I didn't really come home until I got back to Washburn. Um, but this is me, this is where I'm based now. And this is kind of where I started. I've lived four major places in my life, Superior, Wisconsin, where upon thinking about it, um, I grew up in the North End and I really never knew where north was because up was always the lake and in Superior up is the lake is not north but for me that was up and so I've been slightly skewed for most of my life because I don't know where where north is um, and then I moved to Bermuda yes the top of the triangle um, and I lived overlooking the ocean again close to water and and I, I loved it. It was, it actually reminded me, there's a, a shot I recently saw and read it about, um, it's a shot of Bermuda, but you, if you didn't know better, you would say it's Lake Superior. So when I was there, I, I never really got homesick because I was still on that big body of water. And then I moved to San Diego, which people love. <laughs> and I was really glad to escape there and um, move back to Washburn. Um, and it seemed like a big jump and people were like, why the heck did you do that? But again, it was having a closer connection to the water and being you know, access, accessible to the water and having this, this lifestyle. I choose this lifestyle because it's what fits. It's um, wearing whatever clothes I want and going to wherever I want without having to fight with 1 million other people um, with that resource. Um, and a lot of people would know my former work from Big Top Chautauqua. I was marketing director there for eight years, but I've done just about everything. I've worked in print shops, magazines. I even had my own line of breast cancer pins and coins and stuff. But now most people know me as the poster lady. And if I go in public with my kids, people will be like, oh, I know you from your posters. And my kids are like, oh no, there she goes. Um, but th this is the thing that I love. Um, it's been a really interesting ride on how I even got here. I was a graphic designer and I did this poster for um, my cousin. 
And it kind of started something. I had no idea where it was going. Um, so that started this whole interesting journey I've been on with this poster art. And these are actually my first two posters that I ever released to the public. Um, and I, I drew heavily on the WPA style and, you know, Bermuda travel posters, because that's what I had access to when I was there. But um, I loved the WPA style and I did it. I loved it for two reasons. There's the National Parks posters and there's also the Sea America posters. And then there was just general health and wellness posters. But the point of the posters was to get out. And they hired artists to create posters of um, a, a number of the parks that were um, established in the, the 1930s. And then they heavily distributed this artwork to inspire people to travel. And that's kind of the, the mentality I take into it as well. Um, I don't have super high priced images because I want people to have access to them and to travel and to see these places up here. See a huge selection of my collection has water featured in it somehow, some way. If it's an inland lake, if it's a river, waterfalls, and a lot, a lot of Lake Superior. Um, I've been creating this collection for six years now. Oh gosh, no, seven. We're going on seven. Um, and I just keep adding. And the one thing I put in a lot of my posters is water. And it's just like that centering thing. It's the thing that people, when they visit, they want to go to the water. They want to see that, the feature, the beach, the ice caves, the lighthouses. And, you know, we have so many different options for what we have access to here is really exciting. Um, this is how I work. This is my reference photo on the left and the finished poster on the right. And generally speaking, I have for each poster, five to 15 different reference photos that I incorporate into the design because I can pick and choose what I want to go wear, which is like, I have the power. It's my, my favorite thing. Um, and this is one of the, I think the top original five posters that I started with. And what I ended up doing was trying to think of the places locally that people loved. Like when you travel to Washburn, Bayfield, Ashland, the island, where do you love to go? And everyone loves this scene. So this is still to, my, to this day, one of my most popular designs. It sells really well consistently because if you ever go to the town park and wanna recapture the feeling of being there, this is it. And then same with Corny. Um, if given my druthers, I like to go out and take all my reference photos. Um, I do borrow them occasionally from my photographer friends or, you know, public domain, but um, I have a ton of artwork to work with. I, you know, I have an endless um, supply of potential posters and I kind of think in those terms now, especially when I'm on the water. Oh, I see that. That's gorgeous. That could be a poster. And I've got my daughter doing it now too, which is kind of funny. Um, but you can see it's it's kind of exciting, you know. You can do anything you want. And what I really like about my series is when I travel away from the lake, it's a, it's a love letter or a postcard to this area. So I get a lot of questions constantly from people that have never been up here and they're shocked to see the wonderful things that our water provides us um, for recreation and tourism. And I hope I've sent many, many people up here with their, their wallets to enjoy the islands for the first time and go kayaking and, and hiking and have an entire beach to yourself because where else in the world can you do that? Um, it's, it might be really cold water, but you do have it to yourself. Um, and that's kind of my water experience. I mean, all the, I think the first 25 posters I ever did had water in them. And, and it's because it's like that centering anchor that everyone can agree on. It's just, especially when you're on vacation or if you even live here. I mean, I say I like to draw places people love to live and visit in the Midwest. 
and it's those places it's sitting on the beach and just having a deep breath and really appreciate the resources we have here. I don't know where I'm at. So <laughs> that is all I have. Thank you, Jamie. Um, yeah, your posters definitely resonate with a lot of people um, and are very well known around the area. <laughs> Um, reminder to the audience, go ahead and put questions into the Q&A and we will address those in a little while. Um, and, and once again, there's the handout that has information about the artists and links to their websites. Uh, you can see Jamie's work at bemusedposters.com. Um, April, I will pass it on to you. All right, can you hear me all right? Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My name is April Stone and I'm a black ash basket maker from Bad River um, here up in Northern Wisconsin. I've been working with black ash uh, for over 20 years and I wanted to share a little bit about how water is incorporated into my life through my craft. So, I'm gonna share my screen. You got it. Can you see that? Looking great. Okay. Um, I, I have a slideshow presentation that I'm going to try to get through quickly, and um, I'm going to focus on a few of the slides that are especially pertaining to water and talk more about those. But I want to share the story of my, my work as well, um, because it's, it's all in the same thing. Um, so I became a uh, engrossed with a basket. It's the basket on the left was the first basket I came in contact with. Um, it's missing its rim right now, but it functioned as a work basket, lunch basket, catch-all basket for about a year before the lashing broke. And it was at that moment that I kind of woke up to the strength of that material, which grows all around me in Northern Wisconsin. And um, I asked the person who made it to show me how to make baskets. And so I made the one on the, on the right. And part of uh, working with black ash is that I don't ever buy material online or from a basket supply catalog. I go out into the swamps where black ash likes to grow. It likes to get its feet wet and harvest live trees. Um, and this is a picture of my apprentice, uh, Leandra, who I've been working with for the past year. Uh, she's Oneida and um, I've been sharing um, my basket skills with her as a way of continuing the work in the world. And this is her first live harvest of a black ash tree. And so black ash does like to get its feet wet. And, uh, and it lives and grows in swamps with varying water levels. Sometimes it's more muckier, sometimes it's drier. But a lot of people have come out into swamps with me over the years to, um, to harvest and it's been great. Um, and another thing about the black ash tree, which I have learned within the last few years, what, is that black ash, um, it actually, the tree itself acts as a, as a pump for the, for the water table. So it kind of um, regulates the water table in the swamp itself, but not just in the swamp and surrounding ecosystems. So it has an effect, the black ash tree specifically with its unique characteristics as a water pump um, does a lot more, not just for the swamp that it grows in, but in surrounding areas. So I wanted to say that about the black ash tree growing in swamps. In the summertime, when we harvest, um, a knife gets inserted from one end of the log to the other and the bark is peeled off in a big, huge sheet. Um, and traditionally, those sheets were used um, to make baskets with or to cover lodges or dwellings with. And so this is what it would have looked like coming off in the summertime when there's a lot of moisture in the log. And um, the black ash tree itself grows in kind of stages. It has a spring growth and a summer growth. The spring growth is pretty loose. Uh, the cell structure is not very dense or strong, whereas the summer growth is very dense and very thick. So if you see in my hand, I'm holding this thick walled steel pounding implement. I am manually beating the log from one end to the other. And in my left hand, I'm peeling up the summer growth ring from that log. Um, in what's called now splints. And all those splints then get um, removed, all the growth rings get removed from the log one year at a time, sort of reversing its age. For as deep down into the log as, as we can before um, the log doesn't, it's got too many uh, irregularities and it's hard to pound. So that's how the, that's how the material is, um, is secured. 
This is a picture taken just a couple months ago. We did a winter harvest and you can see the, the beautiful sapwood, fresh bright sapwood rings and the darker heartwood rings of this particular ash tree that was harvested um, maybe four miles from my home. In the winter time, the bark comes off very differently. You have to take a draw knife and shave it off. So you don't have a big, large sheet that you can use for anything. But this is a picture of a fellow who came out to my home many years ago to pound a log because he wanted to make a basket. So when he came out, I said, well, let's get to work then. Go out and pound your material. So that's what he had to do. And the, you can see my log pounding station pretty well there. And a picture of the tool. People pounded with different tools over time. And this is just another angle of the splint coming off of the log. The raw material is then coiled up after it's been uh, sized for its thickness, I suppose, and it's left to dry. And when it's ready to rehydrate, um, it must go back into water. So these are coils that had been dried and I was ready to make a basket. So I put the material back in water, it needs to go back in the water um, so that you can further process it because it needs to be pliable. I don't always use my bathtub though, I'll use the lake. So I spend a lot of my time down at, at the lake at the late Joe Rose's place um, down at Waverly. And I would bring my work down there with me a lot. So these are on two different days on Lake Superior. Um, but I would soak my material at home. And if the weather was good, I'd, I'd bring it all down to the lake and I, I would need to keep it hydrated until I was ready to um, split it down. And the lake was like the best bathtub. And the next step of the process would be then to actually, once it's been rehydrated fully, to then split it down its middle, um, making the splint thinner, more pliable to use, and also doubling your stock. And this is what I see when I'm splitting it down manually. Um, on the inside there, it's completely fiber free where my thumbs are sitting, but on the underside where the other fingers are, it's rough with fibers. But essentially I'm making the material uh, easier to work with. And this is a great picture. You can see all this material is wet. Um, it got split down and you can see the beautiful um, color variations of the heartwood, which is dark and the sapwood, which is light. And there's over 300 splints here. And this was a good day's work. The next part of the process is then scraping the other fibers or the fibers from the opposite side of the satin with a knife, trying to remove some of those and then making baskets that I like to make. Bushel baskets, large table baskets, lidded baskets, all different kinds of baskets for the garden, for the table, tool baskets, replications of old baskets found in archives across the United States, pack baskets I love making. Um, there's a man's woman in the front and a woman's basket in the back. Other baskets for just, um, you know, random, random items like pies and other things, harvest baskets or market baskets, and a finished pack basket uh, for my daughter. And then something that incorporates uh, birch strip weaving with black ash and embellishment and uh, a sassy little rim design there. And when I think about how this particular art or craft I, I use that term interchangeably sometimes, got here, I have to think about the migration journey of my own ancestors and how we came to Madeline Island and to the land where food grows on water. And I think about the St. Lawrence River and the coast of New Brunswick and Maine and how, um, you know, my relatives used to live on the East Coast and according to our oral traditions, made our way inland across the Great Lakes to this place. But along the way, people were making baskets with this same material even over in New York, there are oral histories with the Mohawk, you know, they have oral histories about black ash basketry over there uh, that predate settlement. And so I think about like, well, what is the story of black ash basketry and how did it get to Northern Wisconsin? And so this is just a theory I have. And I, I, and I can't talk about black ash without talking about the emerald ash borer, which many of you probably know about invasive borer that has come over, it's been over and, the United States for a number of years and it's killing millions upon millions upon millions of trees. Ironically, the very obscure material that I work with and that not, not a lot of black ash, there's not a lot of black ash basket makers out there. This one little tiny bug is wreaking havoc. And this bug prompted me to build uh, the burial basket project, which is mostly an artistic statement with myself 
and my relationship between working with black ash and the emerald ash borer. And so it seemed like uh, when, I, when I was doing this project, it was a pretty sad time in my life because I felt like I just got people educated and like informed about the black ash baskets, how to make them, how to harvest them. You know, we're doing all this fun stuff and now this beetle's coming through. So I, I felt I needed to make a coffin to kind of symbolize what I feel was happening with black ash, which was its death. So I had this project set up in downtown Ashland for about a month. People from all walks of life came in the door over a 30, 30 day span and helped work on the project and learned a lot. I made a lot of friends and made a lot of connections. And um, after 30 days, all I had done on it was the bottom. And then I put it away for a year. And when I got it back out again to finish it, I needed a big bathtub. And so I went back down to the lake to put it in the water because it was the biggest bathtub I could think of and spent um, that afternoon taking the whole thing apart so that I could redo it. And now it's in process. And now it's where it needs to be, which is at the Minnesota Historical Society. And the thing about working with uh, black ash is that you can make small baskets, you can make big baskets, but these, what I do, it takes me kind of all over the place. Um, I'm able to reach many different audiences in many different locations through my work. And as a, as a benefit to the, of that, I'm able to help educate people on the effects of the emerald ash borer on black ash, the changing landscape, what could happen to the water tables if the black ash tree no longer is there to act as the pump, what other trees can come in to help uh, kind of moderate and, and, uh, and regulate that water table, um, or what other materials uh, can we work with besides black ash. Um, so it, what I do, um, I, I'm really, I feel really grateful for because it takes me all over to all of these different places. And I work a lot with youth and I'm able to sit and, and work on baskets or other projects with them, but most of our projects are related to water. And um, the empowerment that um, comes as a result of youth working with material, empowering themselves, making something with their hands. You know, this is like art therapy. It gives them a chance to talk. It gives them a chance to go through their day, to think about what's bothering them and to release that. So it's actually, you know, working with ash basketry is, is like super, super healing for myself and for other people who find themselves sharing space with me. And we always have a good time. And this is up in Grand Portage. Someone, someone always puts the puts the basket on their head. And this is working with youth. Um, and again, it's that empowerment. It's, it's what I can help, what I can share with the kids and what the kids can share with me. You know, they teach me how to be flexible. Uh, they're like, we don't care if it's not perfectly square. You know, they, they set it straight with me and I like that. And, and these are young folks. These are like second graders, I think. And um, I used to think it was really challenging going into a classroom where there was just second graders, but then I realized that they actually teach me so much and I love it. Um, and then this final picture I have is um, at, again, uh, down at, at Joe's. Um, we live harvested a tree because the campground where everybody camps at down there, if you've, if you've never been down there, it's this like 100 acres of beautiful, beautiful lakefront property smack dab in the middle of the reservation right on Lake Superior and we have this gathering down there every um it's about every third week in August and it's called the traditional ways gathering and the gathering calls people from all over Wisconsin and in some parts of the world not all over Wisconsin all over the United States and in some parts of the world um, and what we have is I'm a co-director for that um gathering and um it's a nonprofit organization and we have 40 plus instructors that come in for seven days and teach over 50 classes and um, people come all over and continue to repeat coming all over to visit that place because of their draw specifically to the lake and specifically to what handcraft art making things means for them and how it helps heal them and then they carry that energy with them all year long until they come back to the gathering so um this is the last picture that I have that I wanted to share. And what you don't see behind me is the lake because that's where I am. So do I wanna say anything else? 
Um, I think that's about it. Uh, one thing I do want to add about the soaking of the splints and the rehydration is that like water plays such a critical role in the growth of the tree and the trees. Um, relationship to its immediate surroundings and the surroundings around it and how it helps regulate and moderate that water table and then how when you're beating the log your moisture is spraying from both ends of that log and from all around because of all the moisture that's in it and then when it after it dries you have to rehydrate it again to further process it and then you have to keep it wet the whole time you're working with the material um, until you're done weaving the basket. Um, so water is involved in so many, so many stages of the basket itself, the basket making process itself. And I don't just work in my bathtub. You saw pictures of me working at the lake. And you also, um, what you didn't see was me soaking my splints in inland lakes when I have to travel and I have to uh, soak material in other places where I find myself. So for me, working with water is, um, is a critical part of the basket making process and something that I, I truly love. Thank you so much, April. Your baskets are just a fantastic way of mingling natural resources and our culture together. Um, so we have a bunch of questions starting to come in and we have some time to be able to answer those questions. So I'm gonna start working my way through the list. Um, first one is for Mary. Mary, have you ever met someone that didn't care about water? Um, no, but what I have met, I want who I have met, I've, I've seen some chalkboards that, in fact, in that um, video I showed, there's a woman named Jessica who runs a uh, fish, she's a, from a fisherman family up in Port Wing, and her word was industry. And like I said, I came to this project through the mine and then through that CAFO with all those hogs from our And so my first I would use, but then I realized that that is again, the power of the collective is that her words belong in the story if we're speaking towards what that water means to us. And so that was kind of an interesting, I've run into some words like that where I'm like, hmm, what is, why is this studying on my heels? And then questioning, you know, how, how do, when you are working in the collective, that doesn't mean we all walk in lockstep with each other. It means that we may not, we need to always say, instead of saying, let me tell you something, tell me more. And it was through that tell me more conversation with Jessica. I was like, oh, okay, this makes sense. That word does definitely fit. This one seems to be a question for everybody. So um, I'm going to work my way through everyone. Uh, since you're all artists, have you reflected on what it is about water that really moves people? Um, and I'm gonna start with Jamie. I think the connection with um, water is just so primal. It's right, it's like, you know, water, wind, it's things that feed our soul that, you know, nobody can say, I hate water. I mean, I, I guess you could, but there's almost no way you can look at this lake and go, that doesn't move me. Um, it's amazing. And, you know, to be able to sit there and just take it in and use it as a calming presence in your life. I mean, you don't go away from the lake mad. April, I'm gonna go to you next and then we'll pass it to Mary after that. Yeah, I don't think I can add much to what Jamie said because Jamie used a lot of words that I would have used to describe that. How I, but I will add that I do know a few people that don't like to swim, but they will, they will definitely enjoy sitting on the beach by the lake all day and feel and feel loved and feel revived at the end of the day and not even go in the water. And um, I would just add that I think the reason why water is um, so unifying is that there's resonance. We, I mean, we, when we, we live in a world that really values individualism and you know we're all that in a bag of chips, but we're, first of all, we're not all that in a bag of chips. And secondly, we are water. So when you're, when you're around water, you're in that space of resonance, that space of communication that has nothing to do with the human mouth, which is a beautiful thing. And it has all to do with the human heart, which is why, and that's where that resonance lives and moves through us. Thank you guys, that, that was great. Um, audience, please feel free to keep asking questions. We do have you know, approximately 20 minutes to be able to answer those. Um, next question is for Jamie. 
Do you have any postcard sets available? Sets? No. Um, I find it hard to group everything together because my collection keeps changing. Um, I have to update my catalog almost weekly because um, I tend to add a new design every couple weeks. If not, um, I'll go through spurts where I'll do five posters in a week. Um, so just to keep that all together and online in a way that's accessible. Um, I prefer to do sets when I'm in person doing a show or hopefully soon when I open a shop where you can come in and select a bunch of ones that resonate with you because it's not always from the same collection. Like if you want all the Lake Superior ones, that's fine. But then there's that Bayfield one you just need to have. Um, I do have, you know, shameless promo here. My book is coming out next week and it's got my first hundred designs in it. Um, it took me about a week to lay this out, but when I added all the time I'd put together for the posters, it's about a thousand hours worth of work. So it's not quite a, a, a collection of postcards, but it is a collection of my first hundred designs. And most of those are, you know, my most popular ones. Awesome. Thank you. Next question is for April, but first I did want to point out that I forgot to mention earlier in the handout that has the websites, there are two links to videos uh, from April. One of them is from the Minnesota Historical Society, I believe, April. <laughs> and then the other one is from the North, North House. North April. House School. Thank you. <laughs> I'm tongue tied after a few of these. Um, so April, the question for you then, is how can a person learn to make baskets like these? Are there resources available for people that don't have mentors? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's definitely places around the United States, mostly East Coast over to the Great Lakes, maybe even over to Min into Minnesota that teaches classes. I don't know where the person is, is, is located at currently, but um, I know I offer classes in my own studio. Um, that's on that's where I live. It's my studio is right behind my house on the Bad River Reservation. Um, and then I always invite people just to come up and visit and, and let's let's talk about the material. Let's let's chat about it. If people are interested in going out and, and seeing what a live harvest is all about. I welcome people to get a hold of me to do that because I think it's it's important work and, and it's pretty easy to weave a basket, but to go out and get it from the beginning is a whole different, it's a whole different experience. So otherwise, uh, basket supply catalogs online, you can order a black ash splint through through that avenue as well. What is the best way for people to get a hold of you if they're interested in reaching out in that way? Uh, they could send me an email or uh, Instagram or call me. What is your Instagram handle? April.l.stone. Awesome. I don't think I have that on the handout. So excellent. Uh -huh. We don't have any new questions um, yet. Oh, we I do have one, but Lissa, go ahead and do yours first. <laughs> um, well, um, a couple for each speaker, but I don't want to be a hog, so I'll, I'll take my turn. Um, first, Mary, I'm just curious, um, how did, you used to run a restaurant, which is really different than um, environmental advocacy. So I'm curious, how did Words for Water and your water advocacy change you? Um, yeah, I've had a many, many different jobs. And, uh, but water has always been kind of my thing. Lake Superior is my thing. And so I think that everyone, I mean, like back to what I, that quote I gave earlier from Beekner, which is everyone has that intersection between recognizing or witnessing the world's deep hunger and knowing what makes you happy. And for me, it was, uh, fine. It was looking at the world through the lens, a lens of a camera. And then also, um, just kind of making it up as you go along, like all this stuff. I mean, I know that it sounds like you're seeing the finished product and it might look like all, you know, great, which I think it is pretty cool, but it happened just organically. It didn't, I had no idea when I started Words for Water that it would end up having, you know, I'd have a thousand photos. I thought it was just going to be kind of a cool way to use a Dave Matthews band song, to be perfectly honest with you. So, I mean, that's kind of where this stuff happens. And so it, when we use, you know, I, I do, I guess I would consider myself an advocate for water, but I'm just, I'm a mom, I'm a woman who lives here. I'm a friend, I'm a community member. 
And I'm someone that just is doing my little tiny part, like back to that murmuration. I'm just hoping that the seven birds who are around me catch a little bit of what I'm throwing down and they and it inspires them to move. That's lovely, thank you. All right, this is a question for all three of you. Um, so we'll start with, um, probably start with April and then go Jamie and then Mary. <laughs> Much of the rest of this conference focuses on action. The arts have often been a force for action in human societies in the past. Are any of you action oriented? How do you or can you use your arts as a force for good? Um, well, can I use my arts as a force for good? Well, the Burial Basket Project was a, was a pretty good um, project to do that involved bringing people into the studio who never cut wood with scissors, who didn't know how to do a twill weave, thought I was being super weird about, you know, weaving a coffin in public. And, um, but what it also did was people just started coming in and started, they just started talking. They just picked up the weavers and I gave instruction, children, old people, middle-aged people, male, female, it didn't matter who you were, or where you came from. It engaged a lot of the community in a way that, well, they never saw before. So that was, that to me was action. And it was, uh, education was involved in that and healing was involved in that as well. Um, so that in and of itself, I think was a great project that brought forth action and awareness and the conversation about death, about life, about healing. Um, some people came into the studio, didn't even want to work on the basket. They brought their beadwork. They just sat on the couch and drank coffee and chit chatted. I mean, um, it was all across the board. And as far as doing this kind of work with um, after school groups or ADD, ADHD kids or at risk youth, that's action as well through, through doing. That's action through weaving. And so, um, um, other ways would be, um, you know, having dreams and the dreams are showing me this is what you need to make and this is why you need to make it. And this is going to be about, you know, missing murdered women, indigenous women and children. And so it's like that, you know, to me, that's action to me, that's thinking about something, res having something resonate with myself, go coming out of the dream time, and then actually making that thing that's going to end up in a gallery next year to try to bring about more awareness for this thing that's happening with our women. And so um, I think there's a lot of action for myself. I don't know if I answered the question, but that's, that's what I got. Me, um, most of my stuff is, is fun, fluffy, um, easy, you know, landmarks. Um, every once in a while, I will do something a little bit deeper. Um, I, and I do use my, my illustration art in my community to promote my community. I live in Washburn and Washburn's kind of like this quiet little place that people drive through, but it's this community that made me stay here. And so I use my talents to promote this community. Um, a couple years ago, I went to a powwow. I love to take um, action photos at powwows and, and powwows in general, I find are the best community gatherings in this country, like hands down. The, the tradition, the community spirit, just the way everything works together is, it's a really beautiful thing that everyone should experience. And for a change of pace, I had a, um, a, a photo that I really, really loved. And I thought, why shouldn't I catalog the regalia? And so I started doing posters of powwow regalia. And what I found was people, when I did shows, didn't understand what it was. And so I got to explain to them what it was and what it meant and how deeply important it was into our, our Native American communities and that they should experience it for themselves and not to be afraid. Like I remember going to my first powwow as a child and I was a little afraid that I wouldn't be welcomed. And that is, for the most part, I think all over the country, not what happens. Anyone that comes to a powwow is welcomed and loved and encouraged to partake in this culture. And so when I have these regalia prints, um, I can help explain 
what the patterns are and the dances they do and, and, and the meaning behind it. And so it's been a really great educational tool um, for people in general. And in, and I don't sell a whole lot of them, but that's not even the point. It's, it's more of the education. You know, I turn them into um, coloring sheets. And I think I sent out probably about 50 emails of those coloring sheets to different reservations and native schools in this country for them to help teach their kids about culture. And um, whoever asked that question, I have to tell you that I love you because I'm all about building power. I think that we, when I mean, you look at what's going on, what has gone on in our country for many, many years is the arts is, um, it's not highlighted. It's not how we look at how, when you think you're gonna build power, um, you can write a letter to your legislator or you can make a phone call or you can, sh I mean, that stuff is, it needs to be in the room, but where power is built is through that collective. And how you get people together is with art. And that space, again, that isn't ego motivated. It's not about you. It's that heart shock, rather, place where people think, this makes me feel good and I want to be there. And um, at the, because so April mentioned dream. So I was kind of hesitant to share this dream because it's going to make me sound like a complete wackadoodle. But it is kind of, it is, um, it's a dream that's informed my entire work. So when I started dealing with that CAFO um, back in the day in 2014, I had a dream where I was talking, it just happened to be Pope Francis, but it doesn't, I mean, it's not a Catholic thing, but he was, he and I were chatting and he asked me, I was getting ready to address a large group of people. And he said, well, what are you going to tell them? And I said, well, I'm going to tell them that they can just do what I, what I did. And he said, no, don't tell them that because that's limiting. What um, your only job on this planet is to build and maintain your signal fire. And the divine is the wind that takes the embers from my fire to start new fires or add to fires already burning. And that shifted everything for me. I realized at that point that um, power is built. I don't need to be responsible for using my art to um, drive that change. I just need to get people in the space where they can come to my fire, what makes me happy, which is taking photos and doing words for water. And they take those embers to where they need to go. And that is, it's in, in my opinion, it's very difficult to do that in any other space that isn't that passion heart-centered space. And so um, when we're talking about how do we use art as you know, bringing, creating action, what Jamie said makes perfect sense that you know, she's, she's sharing her perspective and what she sees and she's introducing people to things so they can fall in love or see why she loves it. The same thing with April. April's making baskets and she's exposing, it doesn't make, it doesn't on its face look like it's something that's building power, but she's putting people in that space to again, realize that resonance with, you know, you need clean water for the ash to grow. You need, and I love the fact that you put people in the space to think about coffins and death. But, you know, that's where the art can, art can soften some of the hard edges of these issues that we need to deal with and deal with power and deal with organizing. And art is that, it, it, art softens the heart, like I said, it softens those sharp edges so where you feel comfortable in that space. Well, I just, I, I just want to follow up a little bit with that, Mary, that was just really beautiful. And, you know, I feel that your energy, as you mentioned earlier, when you were taking pictures of people and you were feeling their energy about their connection to water, I really feel what you said really, passionately. And I'm wondering, sometimes I hear from people who don't consider themselves makers or artists, um, oh, I'm not that good, or I couldn't make anything. What would you say to people who want to take their own signal fire, as you mentioned, and find ways to amplify that and share that, even though they might not bear the label in their own hearts about being a maker or an artist? For me, I mean, I'm always saying this with the folks I work with and for myself, I'm like, are we replacing a kidney? And if we're not replacing a kidney, then that means it's okay to try some stuff. You know, like no one's gonna, it's okay. And it's, no one likes to, you know, fail, but failure is just a, a, an opportunity to see the horizon in a different perspective. So I think just go for it. Cause like I said, no one's, no one's replacing a kidney. It's not, you know, just figure out what makes you happy and start there. Thanks, and I, I did have a question for um, 
Jamie, I love how you're taking your own photographs and then using those as inspiration for how you're manipulating the image. Um, do you ever work with folks who have been to one of their favorite places around the lake or other water body and um, let them send in their picture and you customize an image for them? I do. I do a lot of cabins because <laughs> people like that is their their zen place that's the most important place they go in the summer so i've done quite a few cabins i've done you know memorial images um you know people put a lot of thought into their their weekend homes or their second homes or even their first homes and um to be able to put it up in an illustration um you know and make try to make it accessible so it's not just one print you get you know, cards and stuff, you can share it with your friends and family. Lots of Christmas cards go out with somebody's cabin on it. Um, a lot of times I add new places to my collection when I hear it enough. Like I'll be at a show and people will say, you should do this and you do this and you do this. And if I hear it enough, then I add it to the collection. Um, because um, especially in places I haven't been, you know, Two Harbors, great. I don't know what people love in Two Harbors except for maybe the lighthouse, but they have two lighthouses. So which one do you pick? Oh, the red one, definitely the red one. <laughs> and so, you know, when I hear that, that's when I know I can invest time because I've done enough posters where I love it, but nobody else does. <laughs> and I really enjoy doing it, but it's better to do something that collectively people are more emotionally invested in. We have about four minutes left if any folks want to put some questions in before we um, end today, we'll, we'll still take those. Um, I did have a question for April about the um, the black ash. It was amazing to see that you had 300 of your um, black ash ribbons that go into the baskets. How, how many baskets might come from one tree? Um, there's a lot of... Um... It, it'll vary. There's a lot of variables. Um, so what is the diameter of the tree that you're starting with? Um, is it healthy on the inside? Maybe it was struck by lightning at some point, you know, but you couldn't tell when you were harvesting it. And now there's this big gash on the inside near the trunk. I mean, um, the crown looks really healthy, but when you get in there, maybe there's some heart rot. So there's definitely some variables that show themselves after you harvest. Uh, working with ash in different locations, I, I take all that stuff into consideration, which then prompts me to either not harvest that tree or to har harvest that tree. And if somebody's tree harvested, I say, well, it could be heart rot, but let's harvest it and see what happens, you know? And so therein lies part of the lesson of the, of the whole teaching. But um, there's definitely variables. How thick are the growth rings? Do they need to be separated? Are, was it drought, a droughty year? Not a lot of growth. Are the are those splints paper thin stuck together? So, you know, how big are the baskets you're making? How small are the baskets you're making? You can make 20 large baskets or 100 small baskets. It, there's just so many variables that go into that question. And are you finding that um, black ash are also being affected by climate change? I know you mentioned the uh, emerald ash borer, but is climate change and changing conditions affecting the sustainability of that tree? Um, it's hard to say the effects of climate change right now because climate change is something relatively new on the scene. Uh, so, you know, in the last five years, have I seen a, a lot of difference with trees and climate change? I'd have to say no, there's no way that I could actually tell um, at this time. Awesome. I'm going to start wrapping this up. Thank you all for being here. This has been really exciting. Um, I've been really happy to hear about all of your different projects and what's going on. Um, so thank you all and thank you all